who's first? Explain to me why I'm completely and totally wrong in every way, morally, psychologically. Hi. First of all, it was excellent talk. Thank you. And just your vision now, I'll give you, perhaps you were not aware of this. A week after the war in 67, perhaps you heard the name Yeshayahu Leibovich? Of course. Yishai, I, there was an interview with Yeshayahu Leibovich just to the audience. He is a guy, religious guy, not extremist, with seven different PhDs, taught me organic chemistry. He said, we should not occupy the West Bank. Jerusalem, we have to find a way that should be a unified city. And peace, before, before the Intifada, first Intifada, a lot of Palestinian work in Israel. Today, it's people from Southeast Asia. Yeah. Economically, etc. And when people have no hope, Allah Akbar, Hamas could do their job. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with Thanks. all of that. Yeah. I think you're right. Thank you. Uh, who's next? I can't believe I convinced everyone. Uh, the lady here. I just ca I can't believe that everyone agrees with me. That's that on a college campus. That seems yeah, impossible I think on so many levels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, oh, you're welcome. And I'm interested that you locate the support for the one-state solution pretty much primarily in, um, you know, the United States and the diaspora. Because yeah. um, during ethnographic and other research in the West Bank, I've actually see, say, seen a fair amount of support for the one state on the ground there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if, I, you know, I could just press you a little bit on yeah. what is... Um, sort of your characterization of various events going on in the occupied territories over the last 20 years. For example, right. the idea that uh, the first intifada broke out because it was spontaneous and that was the only reason that it could, make, it could be nonviolent for the yeah. amount of time that it was nonviolent. Um, yet there's a history of popular resistance and you know, mostly nonviolent resistance, or as you said, symbolically uh, violent resistance uh, that had been going on in the West Bank and Gaza for, mm -hmm. you know, decades before 1987, uh, and obviously the leadership of the First Intifada was, in fact, quite united. Yes. Um, obviously, movements like this, um, you know, face counterinsurgency tactics, and, you know, I think that was certainly one of the things that broke down the First Intifada, and I think it's also very telling that the same kind of popular resistance is actually going through a resurgence right now, the same kind of popular, mostly nonviolent, yep. or symbolically violent, as you put it, and, and uh, it's resistance being met with is, violence. and it's being met with violence, yep. and, and, and Israeli counterinsurgency, but I think yep. that is, and, and in fact, uh, Israeli solidarity, Jewish-Israeli and Palestinian-Israeli solidarity with Palestinians in the West Bank, um, in the movement against the yeah. wall has actually right. been uh, really vital to that movement. And I think that, you know, mm. might shed a little bit of a different light on this issue. Mm, um, no. Also, having spent time on the, uh, in the West Bank and, again, yeah. seen some support for this issue there on the ground yeah. and not just only here on college campuses, mm. um, I, I've seen Palestinians uh, in the West Bank who, you know, see the on-the-ground integration between the West Bank and uh, and Israel, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of right. um, you know bureaucratic fr structures as well, yes. um, and you know uh, obviously sort of removing settlers from Gaza is an entirely different project than removing settlers from the West Bank. In Politically, terms of the it's scale. different. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I acknowledge that. And uh, you know, I think also these Palestinians are absolutely not being duped by the attempts to build a quote state on the ground in the West Bank, Salam Fayyad's initiatives to do state building, when it's very clear that there's no form of Palestinian sovereignty that can be granted without Israeli acquiescence. There's no control yeah. of borders, there's no control of the air, there's no right. control it's of a, it's a the ground. Yeah, it's a compliment and so to Pal the many Palestinians from that perspective yeah. say, listen, we are exactly as you said, you know, we are effectively under Israeli sovereignty, yeah. so why shouldn't we take the next step and instead be equal citizens because it, under the Israeli state. But how, how will you do it? That's but the I mean, question. I think you ended with the point that, you know, yeah, I think you ended with the point that the two-state solution is very difficult to achieve. And yes. many one-staters would say absolutely the same thing. Yeah. So I guess True. what I'm asking about is, you know, could you speak a little bit more to the diversity of Palestinian yeah. opinions in the West Yeah, Bank? absolutely, I will. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I, I think there is a a certain constituency for this. And, and I think it would be very easy, and I actually said this, I think it's easy to convince Palestinians this is a good idea. It, it does appeal to them. It, it meets their needs. They're not the ones who are going to say no to this. 
They would say yes. Of course they'd say yes to this. It's the Jewish Israelis who are never going to say yes to it. Never. And I still haven't heard any explanation ever of how effectively you could get them to do it. Uh, the, at least with the one state thing, with the two state um, outcome, I can be very specific about what it's going to look like, and, and we are. Uh, I can also be very specific about how we're going to get there. A new dimension just added by this state building exercise, which um, it's not anything to be duped by. It's, it's real on the ground stuff. In each individual project doesn't have a strategic impact, but if you did it on a sustained basis for years, it would have a strategic impact without, without question, the same way that settlements do. Uh, I think. Um, now, you can be skeptical about that, but it, it's not an effort to supplant the diplomatic process. It can't be. Right? Actually, the biggest way to kill the state-building enterprise is for the diplomatic process to collapse completely. Right? That, that would do it in, because uh, then it won't have a corollary, a political corollary. It won't have a vehicle for translating the political impact. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are uh, plenty of Palestinians who, who think this is a good idea in the West Bank, but I'm telling you that uh, the political rhetoric in the of, of, of people who are opinion makers, people who are political leaders, people who have political organizations, I mean real ones, not, not just me and my friends, but you know, <laughs> true political organizations, uh, haven't adopted this as their goal. And I think there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason for it is that it doesn't make sense strategically, uh, because precisely everyone knows that the aim, I mean, for people living under occupation, I think the most important thing is ending the occupation, for the most part. I mean, you can find ideological people who prefer an Islamist vision that has nothing to do with that, or you can find other people who have broader ambitions. But I think, I think that, that makes sense. And the fact that all the political organizations that are not Islamist, that are substantial uh, in Palestine, are pushing exactly for that makes sense. So, uh, you know, what I'm talking about here is what drives this stuff. And I think it really is a kind of a diasporic discourse. The other big, by the way, the other big uh, body of opinion, which I should mention, in f that, that has really embraced this in a very strong way, in a completely different way than you find it expressed in the West Bank or, or Gaza, is the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Right? It speaks to them, too. They are really starting to get interested in this idea. It's spreading among Palestinian citizens of Israel the way it's spreading on college campuses in, in, here in the United States. It may migrate to a, 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 dis, a, you know, a discursive level that has a political impact in the occupied territories. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe it will. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Hussein. This is a uh, very... Uh, interesting presentation and uh, has lots of uh, valuable uh, arguments. I'll, I'll start from, uh, from the beginning. I'll try to make it short so Leila wouldn't. Uh, uh, I'll start from your very articulate, persuasive argument about uh, what would be the alternative of two-state solution with which I completely agree. Okay. Uh, and what would be the alternative of, a, of that in, ter in terms of not status quo, but changing the status quo into religious war? Mm. But I think it's precisely because of that that responsible people should be thinking of an alternative. Uh, it comes in addition to your argument that two-state solution, you are saying you are not too optimistic, right? Not particularly. You're not particularly optimistic. No. I'm more, more optimistic about that than any other. I, I think it's the second, well, okay, it's the second can, most likely outcome. Right, okay, War so, is the most likely. All right. So you are not particularly optimistic. Right. Let's put it in your own words. So right. people are not particularly optimistic. Right. And we see what the alternative is. Yes. And I think then responsible people would think of a vision in which Israelis and Palestinians have the responsibility of thinking about ways, not necessarily one state, could yeah. be something different. Could be something different of... Now, I think you are also not completely accurate, if I may say so, Please, yeah. although you, uh, you corrected that at the end by including Palestinians inside Israel. But it's, uh, there are a number of individuals here and there on campuses, diasporic and so on, uh, but there are also the communities of refugees. So yeah. there are the Palestinians in Israel who are not served by two-state solution. Right. And I'll end my question with that in a minute. And the refugees. And I think, again, I don't think there is support 
for that idea in the West Bank. Because the West Bankers, particularly the elites in the West mm. Bank, want simply a Palestinian state. Yes. They just want the occupation to get off yeah. their back and to live alone or separately like, like the Israelis. Mm. So that's another thing. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask you the following, uh, the, the last question. Uh, you raise many, many difficulties for the, two, for, for the one state solution, which I agree with many of them, incidentally. Mm -hmm. What's the vision? What would you do with Palestinian nationalism? These are very legitimate questions. But let me ask you this. Yeah. Uh, I, again, agree with you that settlements and so on, with all the difficulties, are a matter of political will, and they can remove, be removed as a political will with all the difficulties of doing that. But don't you think that the price that the Israeli society would be paying in that case, uh, would, it, it would require a recognition by the Palestinians of Israel as a Jewish state. Yeah. And would the Palestinians be able to deliver that? And if they don't, what are we talking about? It's not a matter of political will or not, it's a matter of the okay. question of legitimacy yeah. in the first place and whether we shouldn't be thinking of ways where the Israeli Jews and the Palestinians should live together in a mutual legitimacy, yeah. in a setting of mutual legitimacy right. of which we, sh we should be thinking. Okay, uh, two parts to that question, and I'll take them both. Let me, let me take the, uh, the second part first, which is uh, the question of, um, of uh, well, no, I mean, uh, let, me, let me see, uh, uh, my brain isn't working very well, but, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a question in there about uh, looking for alternatives. Yeah, I, I agree completely. We should look for alternatives. There's no doubt we should look for it, it's, it's a It's an intellectual exercise, not a political exercise, but it's an important intellectual exercise. However, there's a very important standard that, you know, for a scientific idea has to be, you know, it, to be a properly a, a scientific idea it has to be falsifiable, right? Otherwise, it's not a scientific idea. You take, take my point, right? You understand what I, you get what I mean? Yeah, it has to be disprovable. Otherwise, it's not a, there has to be tests that can prove or disprove the scientific idea. Otherwise, it doesn't rise to the level of being a scientific idea. It's some other kind of idea. I think to qualify as a solution or a real political idea about this conflict that should be taken seriously and, and explored further once it's floated, it has to meet the test of, of, of being in, in some way compatible with the essential national uh, interests and project, the minimum national requirements of the people who are supposed to agree to it. So for me, the Jordan, Egypt, uh, Palestine thing doesn't make any sense, and it's an alternative, but it's, it's not a real, it's not a political alternative. It's not a, re it's not a solution alternative. It's, it's some idea that is um, implausible and, and silly. And I think the same thing applies to this idea in this form. Uh, there might be a way of constructing a vision that does appeal to Jewish Israelis, that does incorporate their narrative, that does meet all these things that I think the present rhetoric not only doesn't do, but actually runs away from and, and is, has a counterproductive effect because it's very strident. And it, 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 it is, couldn't be designed better to push mainstream Jewish Israelis away. You could maybe rejigger this in a way that it comes out looking very different, and now suddenly you're dealing with a real idea, especially if it gets taken up by actual organizations. All of that would be very useful and very interesting, but I think you've got to subject it to that, to that crucial test. You know, does, does this, is this plausibly acceptable to the people who are supposed to accept it? Or can we say with virtual certainty that the people who are supposed to accept it will not and cannot be compelled to? And I see only one that idea that's been fully fleshed out that meets those standards. And, and that's the idea of, of uh, an independent Palestinian state in the occupied and end to the occupation. Now, I'm certainly open to the prospect of there being others, and, and I think we do have to think about them carefully. But I'm not giving up on that test because this has to be a serious discussion about things that are politically viable things that are real political ideas, not fake political ideas, not the box that an idea came in. So that's what I'd say. Yes, sir. 
Um, I'd like to just bring it back to Prime Minister Fayyad for one second, because I know he's someone that the task force has had um, a healthy, strong relationship with in the past. Um, I was we, intern- we agree with most of what he's been doing, but certainly not everything. I interned there briefly about yeah. a year and a half ago, so right. that's why I ask. But um, right. he recently, it seems, because he's focused on the technical aspects of, of actually having something to show for his work, has, has been in vogue in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious if you feel that this sort of sentiment that perhaps he could be seen as an alternative to Palestinian leadership that has been described fairly unfairly as stale, perhaps. Yeah. Does that sentiment extend to the West Bank and Gaza? And is there a no. possibility he'd ever become a popular leader? Uh, well, uh, is it possible he'd become a popular leader? I guess it's not impossible. But this man is not a politician. He's not charismatic. His party is negligible. Um, he is in the position he's in under the protection of Abu Mazen. And he's also in it for another reason, which is that Palestinians need international aid, and there isn't another senior Palestinian figure who uh, international donors, including Arab donors, are really comfortable giving large amounts of money to. That's a fact. And if you want to, if, 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 it just, <laughs> people aren't gonna write the check to anybody else right now. Now, maybe one of the things that this administrative restructuring that he's doing, which amounts, by the way, to a form of glasnost and perestroika uh, in, in Palestine, because it's separating the party from the government. And it's quite unpopular with some people in, in senior positions in Fatah, precisely the way glasnost and perestroika were unpopular with some Soviet um, apparatchiks. If you separate, administration from party, you're taking away people's prerogatives, their patronage, their stuff. Uh, not everybody likes it. There have been several efforts to get rid of the guy from within the Fatah, Fatah as a party. Uh, but he has the political protection of Abu Mazen. He's operating under the sort of imprimatur of a real politician who in the first half of 2009, gained a great deal of strength and credibility through a series of different things. I mean, the Obama initiative, uh, some of the effects of some of the state building stuff, uh, the Sixth Party Congress in Bethlehem, which was you know, a pretty stunning sort of political victory for, for Abu Mazen, and then went into free fall in the second half of 2009, blow after blow, some of them inflicted by uh, miscalculations by the Obama administration, some of them self-inflicted, some of them, like the Goldstone incident, where there was always going to be a price to pay, either diplomatically or politically, and they mishandled it so badly they ended up paying both price, prices almost in full, where they could, could really have, have avoided some of that pain. Um, pretty battered at this point. But what's interesting is that none of that has accrued to the strength of any of his opponents within Fatah, within the PLO, or Hamas, which is... Had an even lousier year uh, and doesn't seem to have gained in, in the least in popular. In fact, it, there was a poll which showed very low numbers for Hamas and lower in Gaza than it is in, in the West Bank, and not surprisingly, I think. Uh, and it's interesting. I mean, Hamas is popular in, like, in Lebanon and Jordan. It's not popular in the West Bank and it's very unpopular in Gaza, according to this recent Pew poll. Hezbollah is only popular among the Shiites in Lebanon has some very limited support from Christians, 18%, 2% support among Lebanese Sunnis. Very popular in the West Bank, very popular in, uh, in uh, Gaza. So some of these movements are a little bit like, like Che and Fidel. You know, the further away you are from them in Latin America, from Cuba, the better they look. And uh, I think that's, that's a Hamas phenomenon as well. I don't see an immediate prospect of Salam becoming a conventional politician. Um, and I don't think he wants to be a conventional politician at the moment. I think he needs Fatah. Fatah needs him, even though they don't like it. This appendectomy they're getting, <laughs> part of their own privilege, is, 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 is essential to their health. It's good for the government. It's good for the party. And um, they'll be the better for it. So they need to bite that bullet and, and, and take it. But um, we know, we'll see. We'll see how far this goes. It's, it's not impossible, but I don't, uh, I don't anticipate it. Right behind you. Hi, uh, my name is Nicholas Kenny. I'm a doctoral student here. Um, Great. I lived in Israel for a year, and I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks oh, for coming tonight. Sure. Um, you leave us the impression that the one-state solution is dead on arrival. 
and the two-stage solution is hanging on for dear life. I think that's just about right. So at what point, though, does the two-stage solution die I, I, in your I, mind? I told you. We have, we, we have half a million settlers, yeah. give or take, yeah. in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Right. If those numbers to continue to increase, won't at some point the political constraints on the yes. Israeli leadership become so great that yes. they don't have an option? Yes, to, to both of those questions. I mean, I did, I did explain what I think, but I'll explain it again quickly. Um, yes, of course, uh, the, the political viability of an agreement regarding the end of the occupation is, is threatened by every new settlement. Every new settler increases the constituency, rather belligerent one in many cases, uh, that opposes this. But, but settlers are really very concentrated in large numbers. And if you look at, at the idea of a land swap, a serious one, you, you, you're not talking about 500,000 people potentially facing evacuation. You're talking about 60,000, probably. It depends how you do the math, and this is all subject to negotiations. But it's, it, I'm not trying to diminish the problem. The problem is very enormous, and the problem is very huge. And at a certain point, it does die. And it dies when people on both sides, a solid majority over an extended period of time, conclude that it's not desirable or possible anymore. When the political will dies, it dies. That's the metric. I don't think the metric is bricks and mortar and settlers. Uh, I think that affects the perception of people, and it should affect the perception of people, about the desirability and the viability of this outcome and this solution. But I don't think it's the right metric. So that's the metric, is, is a p political will is the metric. Because all of those things are subject to political will. And uh, yeah, there may, I, I mean, I do think there comes a point where people say this is not going to work. And many people have come to that conclusion already. At that point, though, you have to have a viable alternative, or you're walking away from what is conceivably an out to a very dangerous situation. I mean, I would say it's so bad that you know, to friends of Israel and friends of Palestine, we can say of, of them in the Middle East, our friends are in a mutual suicide pact. And it looks like they're actually going to do it. And we have to do everything we can to convince our friends not to commit suicide. And if they insist on it, we probably can't save them from themselves. But at least we can try. And I think that's the situation exactly. And someone can come up with a viable alternative that's a real serious political idea that is potentially acceptable by both sides and has some political support and has some international support and some basis in international law and some political will on both sides behind it, I'm very interested. Okay, I think uh, last two she's telling me, so. Uh, who's next? Oh, good. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Uh, let me start by saying I, I completely agree with your preference for the two-state solution, but I wonder if I can... Um, kind of play devil's advocate Please. and make the case for the one-state solution Absolutely. a bit more. On both sides, actually. And it's this. I mean, y your, your contention seems to be that the fatal flaw of the one-state solution is the, the impossibility of convincing the other side yeah. to go along with it. But why is that necessary? I mean, can't you pr conceive of a, of a line of thinking that goes like this? Let the Israelis continue settling. Let them build up uh, the, the, their population in the West Bank mm. to such a degree that in fact they do become inextricable. Mm. Then what happens? Then you have two peoples living uh, intermingled with each other in a manner that does become kind of like South Africa. It is already. Um, and in which therefore the only outcomes, the only outcomes are either going to be the physical annihilation of the other side or some kind of, a, of ah. you see. And then perhaps even harder than that, perhaps even recognizing that, in fact, the more likely outcome is going to be the, 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 the war to end all wars on both sides, but they simply calculate, we'll win. May, you know, uh, okay. uh, uh, and so that maybe is the calculation yeah. of the hard men yeah. on, on the two sides. Yeah. But it doesn't requ it's, there's no illogic to it. There's uh, no flaw okay. in it. It's <laughs> just a willingness to put up with a greater level of horror than you or I would, would find it tolerable. Okay. I mean, yeah, I think there are people, that, that I would describe that as the one state outcome as opposed to the one-state agenda and the one-state solution. That's the one-state outcome. And I think it's not really imaginable without the kind of horror you're talking about. And I think you have to ask, what kind of society is that conflagration going to produce? What kind of uh, outcome is really likely? 
at that stage. I mean, is it going to be, it might be a one state outcome, but is it going to be a desirable one state outcome? Is it going to be something people can really live with? And the pr is the process something one can be sanguine about? I mean, I'm as, as alarmed by that scenario as I am by the scenario that you didn't acknowledge, uh, which is plausible for a little while anyway, which is <coughs> a continuation of the status quo for a very long time, leading to that conflagration. But I think, I think that conflagration can actually be quite a distant one. And I think it behooves everyone, friends of Israel and friends of Palestine, to consider that it is possible for either one or both to really to lose everything. Consider it. It's not preposterous, yeah? And to end up in a lose-lose situation, inflicting on each other simply blow after blow, indefinitely. I think it's very possible to imagine no agreement and the occupation continuing for, you know, certainly for the rest of my lifetime, which is mainly what I care about, <laughs> and uh, I think that's normal, and uh, probably any children I may or may not have, uh, for their lifetime, in which uh, you don't, you have something like this. In other words, a, an is a, a de facto unified state in which Palestinian rights, for, for the most part, are severely curtailed by a Jewish ethnocracy. I don't think that's impossible to imagine. I think it leads, in the end, to tragedy for the Israelis because of the, the dynamic I explained. But I think you have to... <coughs> You have, if you're going to embrace the one-state outcome, you have to embrace first the uh, plausibility of many decades of continued occupation. And you're going to have to embrace, I think, the likelihood that what is required to get there is an incredible bloodbath and that, that, is, that, that, that the outcome of that is maybe one state, but it may not be a pleasant state. It may not be a desirable state. It may be as bad or worse than the present situation, conceivably. Uh, so, I mean, I, I say go read Ben Vinisti. He, he's right. This is what we have, and this is it. This is the reality. And uh, the, the only agenda that I can see to really change it fundamentally that has political reality of the kind I described is this idea. And so I think giving up on it, highly irresponsible, uh, even if even if there is a, a remote chance of it happening. The, the retort, which uh, the lady in question mentioned, which is, you know, say, well, yeah, yeah, you say your vision is unlikely, we say our vision is unlikely, so our vision is just as good as yours because they're both unlikely. No. An unlikely scenario that's, that's, that has a, a, an international consensus behind it, the, the uh, political will of a majority of both peoples behind it, a vast body of international law behind it, uh, a, a clear outcome, or more or less clear outcome, a clear path to achieving that outcome, which is even being augmented by additional paths, is of a, a completely different order of magnitude of political reality than a bunch of slogans which have none of those things and, and, and can't even be explicated in a coherent way. <laughs>